Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 135 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn all about knives and knife collecting. A busy midweek supplemental episode this week, Bob. It, uh, again, we talk about this all the time. It never ceases to amaze how much stuff there is to talk about. So uh, kind of a quick uh, look ahead of what's coming up. Uh, you got into something over the weekend, mm. uh, some knife making, call style knife. Looking That's forward right. to having a conversation about that. Also, definitely want to uh, talk about the Knife Town Hall show and sale coming up this weekend. We've got some more guests to announce. Several stories in Knife Life news we want to talk about. And, of course, Bob's State of the Collection, where he's going to talk about the new 4Max Scout that he got from Jimmy Slash. And the uh, huge, I don't know if I can pronounce this, Chubberukov Bear? Chubberukov? Yeah. Okay. Chubber-Kof. All right. Yeah, Chubberukov Bear. Okay. From the, uh, from the Pass Around group that you're going to do a little audio review on. So, uh, a lot of stuff, man. A lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then at the very end, I, I want to talk. This isn't a, a uh, necessarily a first tool segment because there's not much research to do on this topic. But I want to talk about Pical style knives a little bit and how my mind has turned a bit uh, since a recent interview we did. Hmm. You're just yeah. going to leave that hanging out there. I'm like just, that. Yes, exactly. Well, that's okay. that's that's a uh, that's that's a little bit of uh, business craft there, or, or, or you know, TV craft. The mystery and the intrigue to make people want to stay till the end. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Episode 135 again, full of uh, good, hopeful, uh, useful information for you. And uh, if it is, we hope that uh, you'll do us a favor and uh, give us a like. A thumbs up, whatever uh, podcast player app you are using, and uh, also share with a friend. If you uh, have a knife maker friend, a knife lover friend, anybody that uh, is into knives and you think would enjoy the Knife Junkie podcast, we would certainly appreciate the favor of you sharing the link, and uh, hopefully that uh, they'll become subscribers. It's just a great way to uh, show some love to the show. Give us a rating, give us a review, but uh, more importantly, subscribe, whether that be the audio podcast or the uh, video where we also put the podcast up. And Bob, I know we hadn't planned to talk about this, but I do want to mention this. We've kind of improved, I guess, the uh, the weekend interview uh, shows, the podcast. We're now doing those on video so that when we post the Sunday interviews on YouTube, it'll actually be a video instead of what they call the audiogram, a static picture with a little waveform going. So those are going to be going on video and our patrons will get early access yeah. three days early. We'll be posting those on Fridays for our patrons, whereas the uh, Sunday interview show will go up on Sunday. So a couple of changes there. Yep, yep. And if you've ever seen Thursday Night Knives, you know Jim is a video pioneer for us here at the Knife Junkie Podcast. And he suggested, let's start, you know, we we use this platform to do Thursday Night Knives every week. And it's great. Why not just start doing this with the interviews? And uh People would have a chance to actually uh, show something that they're talking about during the interview. And uh, so, yeah, I I think it's an improvement, too, though, uh, you know, there might be a reason why we don't record these supplementals. Maybe people don't want to see what we look like on uh, Sunday mornings. I think that's an excellent reason. I know I don't want people to see what I look like on <laughs> Sunday mornings. <laughs> but yeah, we do the uh, the recordings of these supplementals, as we've mentioned, I think once or twice before, kind of letting the little secret out that yeah, uh, we do yeah. the Sunday recordings for our Wednesday show. But yeah, keep a lookout for that. We've got a couple of uh, great uh, interviews coming up in the can that are already uh, in that new video style that'll be coming out on the YouTube channel. That's the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Speaking about video and Thursday Night Knives and, of course, Knife Town Hall, which we've done uh, several of. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's going to be kind of a regular monthly kind of thing where we try to do a special Knife Town Hall once a month or so. And this month is going to be a really special Knife Town Hall because it's the show and sell edition. It's on the same weekend that Blade Show was originally scheduled, the second originally scheduled (laughs) Blade Show since they had postponed it from the original date. But, of course, that is now not happening. And we decided that uh, we wanted to try to bring, you know, knife makers together, give them an opportunity to show off their wares. If they didn't have any wares to sell, just at least talk about what they've got going on in their shop. And we announced uh, several 
folks uh, about a week or so ago. But Bob, there's more additions to the to the Knife Town Hall. Right. Uh, we're going to have Alan Elishowitz, Douglas Esposito of Attention to Detail Mercantile. We're going to have uh, Daryl Ralph, and that's in addition to Marianne Halperin. Uh, Andrew Demko, David C. Anderson, and Sanford Owen. So it's going to be a great showing. And, uh, you know, you mentioned some may not have uh, – Matt Martin from Vehement Knives is also coming. And uh, I, I think I neglected to put him on the list there, Jim. But, uh, you know, he suggested he might not have any stock at that time. And that has a lot to do with how uh, different knife makers, different uh, small outfits and custom outfits produce. Sometimes uh, some makers – have books and they're and they're working on custom orders and other makers make small batches or one offs and sell them as they make them. So, you know, but uh, a, a number of knife makers got back to me and said, I'm not going to have anything to sell. I'd still mm-hmm. like to show up. And then a couple of those had to had to drop out anyway. But, you know, the, the point of this is to meet the meet the knife maker and to have a chance to talk to them. And in this case, uh, definitely to to be able to snap something up that they may have made in preparation for Blade Show. Right. You know? Well, we're calling it show and sell. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely uh, show and sell or uh, just uh, show up and talk and uh, have a chance to uh, have viewers get to know you a little bit better. Because uh, the beauty of the Thursday Night Knives and the Town Hall platform, of course, as you know, if you've watched and if you haven't, uh, we allow folks to actually join in the show with their webcam or their smartphone video. They can just come right on, uh, show off one of the maker's knives, maybe ask a question or two, that kind of thing, get some interaction with the with the knife makers and manufacturers. So uh, that's, that's uh, to me, more of the more beneficial part of the show. I mean, the, a sale yeah. would be nice, but hey, getting to know the maker is, is the benefit there. Yeah, it's like uh, it, the way you just described it, it reminds me of... Uh, uh, modern day AM call in radio in a way, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. we're going to talk about knives today, you know, call into this number and, and then people get to, to voice that, but, but this is less about voicing your opinion. It's more about asking right. questions and, and, you know, uh, uh, th- just meeting them, talking yeah, with them, yeah. meeting them, throwing them a compliment, whatever it is. That's usually yeah. what I end up doing. Cause I'm right. <laughs> Cause you love everybody, man. <laughs> it's all great. And again, that's uh, Saturday, August 8th at noon. That's this coming Saturday, August 8th at noon. That's going to be on the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. If you're a member of the Knife Junkies Facebook page, where honestly, we don't do a whole lot on the Facebook page. Neither one of of us are uh, Facebook guys, but we we have a private Facebook page, thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. Okay, Jim. All right. I know you're not calling me out because you're not a Facebook guy. No, I'm not. I'm calling both of us out. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. But here's something I heard recently. Uh, I can't remember where I heard it, but it, it had to do with these uh, on Capitol Hill. There, there's some, there's some uh, stuff going on with with all the big um, social media companies, I, and I can't pretend to to know exactly what it's all about because I haven't really been following it. But I have heard that of all of the uh, of the big uh, social media outlets, Facebook is the one right now who seems to be the most interested in uh, staying out of everyone's business. So uh, it, it sort of reinvigorated my interest in Facebook. I know that uh, that pretty much every knife maker and successful knife community is doing a whole lot on Facebook. It's a great place, I guess, to have a community. And I just, my bandwidth, hey, there's there's a little bit of a pun there, but my bandwidth is limited and and uh, as all of ours is, and and I just have to shift a little bit of it over to Facebook and I'm going to because I think it could be a great place to forge more of a community with uh, all y'all. Well, of course, uh, as you said, it is a lot uh, spreading ourselves kind of thin, you know, a couple of a uh, couple of podcasts a week, the Thursday night knives, trying to do the Facebook, the Instagram, all that kind of good stuff. So, uh, yeah, help us out. Join the uh, community there or uh, even on the Knife Junkies Patreon group, the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon, where we uh, share exclusive content and bon- bonus early access content. So a lot of different ways you can uh, join the Knife Junkie community. But again, uh, the Knife Town Hall coming up this Saturday, August 8th at noon, live on YouTube and live on the Knife Junkies Facebook page. And uh, Bob, just one more thing. Yeah. I want to ask another favor of, uh, of our, our listeners and our viewers. We have the ability to stream Thursday Night Knives and these Knife Town Halls on another channel. So I'd love to get some feedback from folks. Um, you know, where would you like to watch? I know some folks do a lot of watching on Twitch. 
you know, is is that popular? Would someone you know, or a lot of folks like to to see the knife chucky on Twitch? We actually have a Twitch channel. We haven't done anything with it yet. Uh, you know, are you more uh, inclined to watch on Twitter, you know, slash Periscope? You know, where would you like to see the Knife Junkies, Town Halls, Thursday Night Lives, uh, those kind of things? Because we have a third channel we can actually broadcast to. So give us a call, 724-466-4487, 724-466-4487. Just give us some feedback on uh, what might be helpful for you. Uh, another place to watch. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. All right, back on the Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 135, our Knife Life News segment, where Bob dives into some of the top stories going on in the knife world. And uh, huge, as capitalized <laughs> here in my show notes, Bob, huge new folder in the Poltergeist Works Phenomena series. Yeah, yeah, a Poltergeist Works and Jacob, whose last name, Jacob W. Uh, from Poland, whose last name I, I, I don't even pretend to won't pronounce is always making cool stuff. And he seems to come up over and over on this show. Uh, and I think it's because I just need to get a Poltergeist Works knife eventually. I love his designs. And he's been doing a lot of stuff with real steel. Uh, but on his own line, in his own line pol of Poltergeist Works knives, he just came out with, or, or has just developed, I should say, the third knife in his Phenomena series. And it is, uh, well, it's a knife... Of, I would love to have because it's got a four and a half inch drop point blade. It's got a beautiful blade, but four and a half inches. And uh, it is bigger than the Cold Steel Formax, uh, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. Uh, half an inch longer than the Formax. And to me, that's that's just love right there. And <laughs> bigger is better. Yes, you know, it's got an S35 uh, VN blade and uh, uh you know a, a, a gorgeously sculpted and lined handle lined i mean the lines of it are beautiful and then it's got the signature uh hardware uh at the at, they look like chain ring bolts basically on the on the back and the front you know the pivot and the um, hardware that holds it together at the the pommel it's got a an opening disc i think it's triangular shaped but it's something that sits atop the blade and it just looks just robust as hell and uh it's light at well at 8.8 .8 ounces it's light because this sucker mm. is big and it's all metal so he uh um jacob went to to great lengths to sort of relieve some of the weight with with the pocketing and the titanium and uh the, the uh, a very interesting thing about this one is and he's being very secretive about this uh, but he figured out a way to add the uh, stainless steel lock bar insert without any hardware. Maybe it's like a dovetail or something. Um, but I don't know. That's that's speculation. It, it just looks like a, a really phenomenal knife. The Phenomena 3. Mm -hmm. 4. Uh, 5 I got it. I got it. Now, do you see what I did there? I yeah. did. Yeah. So. You know, you don't uh, get a whole lot of um, scale uh, in the picture. Uh, that we're looking at on Knife News, which we'll have a link in the show notes at thenifejunkie.com slash 135, thenifejunkie.com slash 135. Uh, you know, again, you just don't get that scale in the picture. But No, you don't. But an interesting thing, Jim, is as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the way I knew that is just the, the proportion of the hardware, you know, the pivot. Mm -hmm. He okay. uses that pivot every time and that, and that uh, um, hardware at the pommel, it's the same piece. And he uses it in all of the knives. And so it looks proportionally larger on the smaller knives. So when I saw it on this, I was like, ooh, that looks cool. All right. That's a little, uh, tr almost like a triangular shape, little scoop right on, on the bottom of the handle. What is that for? You mean, uh, yeah, right. R r just uh, to the right of the pivot. So that's so you can access the uh, opening feature. The, the, oh, the yeah, when it pulls together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. It's gotcha. a little occlusion, so you can slide your thumb in there. And and uh, not for nothing, but when uh, knife designers, knife makers put those little scoops to access the thumb stud or the thumb disc, they're they're putting it at the angle at which you should deploy it to get the the best deployment. Hmm. You know, it probably flips open perfectly when you when you channel your thumb into that uh, little groove. Anything else you want to add about the new Poltergeist uh, Works folder? Negative. All right. We'll I'll, move I'll on. just uh, put my uh, address out there if anyone okay. <laughs> wants to send it to me. Uh, sorry, Jim. Go ahead. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, so we go from huge 
to tiny with uh, Top's new mini, and I'm not even going to uh, try to pronounce it. I'll leave the hard words up to you, but something <laughs> something tiny from Top's. Tanimboka Puko. Now, Puko is a traditional Finnish blade, and uh, it is a known to be a very sharp and uh, utilitarian blade with its uh, with its zero ground edge. And all that, but uh, Tops, they just came with the Scandi Edge, is what I'm trying to say. Tops just came out with a with a um, mini companion to their Tanimboka Puko, which is uh, which was a pretty popular Puko des- Puko design of theirs. It's got like an almost four inch, I think it's like a three point six inch Scandi ground blade, uh, traditional Puko shape, uh, also with the same very very neutral handle. So this one that they came out with the mini is a companion piece, but it is super mini. It's, dare I say, cute. Uh, it comes in a little <laughs> a leather, molded leather pouch that you're supposed to wear around your neck. Uh, mm. So it is a neck knife, but it it, it orients itself still with the, uh, with the handle up, unlike most neck knives that use Kydex and, and orient the handle down so you can pull down on it. Uh, this is a uh, field craft, less uh, high speed, low drag, so you have to kind of reach up and pull up and out. But it's a tiny, tiny little knife. I saw a, a video with Craig Powell recently. I think they do a, uh, it was one of their weekly podcasts. And uh, he pulled this thing out and it is tiny. It's got a, a 1.8 inch blade, I believe it is 1.8. I can't, let me, let me find it here in my notes. But uh, it's got a 90 degree spine. So you can uh, strike a ferro rod off of it. It's 1095, their usual steel. And it's coated except on the on the edge. well it's coated with a, that gray traction i think and it's a tiny tiny little awesome knife and you could throw that thing in your pocket and uh i don't know just wanted to bring it up even with the leather sheath 2.6 ounces i i you know i was thinking okay neck knife i can see that but then when you said the sheath and i looked at the picture i was like hey i mean i don't know that i want to be wearing a sheath around my neck is that it, unusual it's a it's a little clunky, I gotta say. But um, now I don't know. I, I'm sure this has done been done plenty and plenty and plenty of times before this. But who's the barefoot survival guy? He was on a History Channel show. I mm. can't remember his name right now. But he 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 um, he's an a- Aboriginal survival dude, and he walked around with a little neck knife. But instead of that uh, uh, orientation where you tug down on it. It, it was like this. It's just like a regular sheath just hanging around your neck. And to me, you know, uh, neck knives are uh, it, the the more unobtrusive, the better. You know, mm-hmm. I carry a neck knife uh, frequently, but it's tiny. It's that little Bastinelli diagnostic. Right. It's teeny tiny. You don't even know it's there. Uh, yeah. But a big leather sheath. Well, obviously, it's a small right. leather sheath, but still, you know, it, it's going to print and it, you're going to feel it. it's going to swing around. Hey, guess what I've got in here? <laughs> Well, if you're like a big burly dude, I could see it being nothing, but I'm not, right. you know, so yeah. I don't know. Might might be a might be a thing, but you can still uh you can just pop this thing in your pocket. That's what I would do with it. That's what I was saying, I pop pop it in your pocket or uh I, I can't really tell, you know, if it has a like a belt loop handle or a belt loop belt loop, you know, that would be kind of neat, I would think, just to have that little thing strapped on your belt. Yeah, it would be, but it uh, it seems to only have a paracord loop. If you look, you can see the stitching uh, right below that paracord. It's it's a pretty tight fit. I don't. You yeah. would have to have a <laughs> a single strand paracord belt to make that work. A tiny loop for your tiny belt <laughs> exactly. for your tiny knife. <laughs> yeah. Hey, maybe that'll work for you since you're a tiny guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It's like uh, it would fit on a traditional size GI Joe. You know the hey, GI Joe they had when you and I were kids. That's right. Yeah. Before they went mini. Go off on a side tangent. I had uh, seven or eight G.I. Joes with, you know, Jeeps and all kind of things. And I remember playing with them one winter day on the outside and it snowed. I left them out and it snowed. And then, you know, several days went by and I, you know, didn't get them. And I guess dogs came and took (laughs) them or animals took them or whatever. So I lost a lot of my G.I. Joe collection. And I wish I had them back because... Yeah, I'd have, I'd have a lot of money there. Yeah, you could, you could, uh, you I could, could buy some knives with that. You could push your eBay forward a bit with that, man. That's right. That's yeah, right. my brother and I just blew them up in the woods. I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is that with the uh, hand grenade that he got <laughs> yeah. from his school teacher or whatever? The bus driver, yeah, yeah bus driver. Yeah, if you hadn't listened to that podcast, go back in the archives on the knifejunkie.com and hear the uh, the Knife Junkies podcast with his brother. 
and learn about that uh, hand grenade hand grenade story as well as uh, some other uh, knife cutting stories as well. All right, Bob. Show notes. I go from huge to tiny to fancy to fancy. So, okay, this is the new CRKT. CRKT has been last two years. I think it. I think it started with the shock. The X O C. The shock. Uh, in uh, a knife on which they introduced their deadbolt uh, lock, uh, which is a pivot based lock uh, with two pins that go through the tang. Um, the shock is a seven hundred and fifty dollar CRKT, which is a shock to the system if you're used to the thirty dollar CRKT, which is which is more uh, run of the mill for them. So they've been producing a number of limited edition knives, which I, everyone has been clamoring for for a long time. Because let's face it. CRKT works with some really great designers to make some really great designs in some very cheap iterations. And so with these limited editions, they've been doing all of that except making them very nice with nice materials, that kind of thing. So the the newest one they have is uh, made by or designed by Duhara, and it's produced by Lion Ste- <clears throat> excuse me, Lion Steel Italy, uh, which is pretty cool. It's called the Hirin. So this is a uh, it's CRKT American company, uh, Duhara designer, and then uh, Italian manufacturer. Uh, it's M390 blade steel. It's uh, you know 3.4 inches long. It's pretty light at 5.9 uh, ounces. But the real interesting thing about this is the design. You see it, mm-hmm. look at it. It it's it's a dagger. But it's a mm. dagger that's missing a huge chunk of steel out of the middle. So it's a yeah. it's, it's a framed blade, if you will. And then it's got this uh, handle that, to me, uh, it's very heavily milled and designed. And it looks like a retro uh, illustration of like a rocket ship or something. Uh, mm-hmm. Th- mm-hmm. That's just my sort of it, it looks like something uh, Buck Rogers might carry. So it's a it's a it's a pretty interesting looking knife. Uh, I saw our, our friend Levon over at the Knife Knife Nuts podcast just had one on his Instagram channel. Of course, he always has everything before <laughs> anyone else. It's so cool, man. It's just you got to you got to give that guy a follow if you want to see what's coming. So this knife is I, not uh, I do not know the the cost of this knife yet, but it's a very premium release and it's very limited release and uh, looks like it's going to be out in well, I, I guess looking at the date, it's out already. You can get it now. Uh, it came out very, very late July, and they only made 500 of these. So mm. if you want to get on this, uh, get on this. Uh, uh, just not for nothing, but Duhara, the designer, uh, designed one other knife for CRKT called the Raikiri, and it was a budget offering. Very cool looking knife. Reminds me a lot of the um, Microtech Sigil. Or the um, I'm not sure if that's under the Microtech or the Anthony Marfione uh, uh, slate, but it looks a lot like the Sigil with enough of its own distinctions that it's not a ripoff, but uh, it kind of evocative of that. So this guy Duhara uh, designs some really unique and futuristic looking knives, and this sort of high cost limited edition iteration of the Hirin through CRKT, you know, looks to be a very interesting thing. Well, CRKT uh, website has it uh, manufacturer suggested retail price of two hundred fifty dollars, <laughs> and uh, looks like at the time of our recording that uh, it is still available. But as you said, only five hundred of them. You never know uh, with that limited quantity whether they'll uh, be here or not. So, if that uh, futuristic kind of design uh, intrigues you and you like it, you may want to uh, go ahead and jump on that and check that out. Yeah, and it looks like it's a liner lock, not uh, not using that deadbolt, which uh, I just wanted to say that because I mentioned the deadbolt earlier on their limited edition thing. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. And Jim, actually, before we leave Life Knife News, there was one other knife I wanted to mention that I did not mention to you in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if I could just mention it here. Michael Zeba, uh, who's a, a Polish-American maker, uh, immigrant maker. He lives in um, Greenpoint, Brooklyn, uh, right near where I used to live. Um, not for now. I just think it's cool. I wish I knew he was there when I lived there, but I didn't. Uh, anyway, so he's got, uh, some amazing folding designs. He came into the industry, uh, for making chef's knives and, uh, chef's knives are extremely difficult to make. Uh, and he's got a, uh, jewelry background, I believe. So he makes these, uh, magnificent knives and, uh, and then he went into, uh, magnificent chef's knives and then he goes into folding folders and folders are all awesome. Our good friend Alex has one. 
really some incredible attention to the detail and sculpture of these things. Anyway, he just licensed a uh, design to MKM. That's Maniago Knife Makers. It's a it's a consortium of knife makers in Maniago, Italy, which is just the knife town in Italy. A, a lot of manufacturers there and in, and uh, companies that that bolster the industry uh, there. So Maniago Knife Makers just took on Michael Ziba. So you can get his MS3, which is a very uh, popular um, Michael Ziba design. It's it's that sl- uh, very thin, slender uh, flipper. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to be selling that with beautiful carbon fiber. You can get it either in a drop point flipper or you can get it in a dagger shaped blade flipper and they add an extra quillion on top to make it look you know more like a dagger. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that because uh, I know that uh, Michael Ziba is a much sought after maker, but his his knives can be pricey and hard to find. And so you know, coming out in this sort of uh, uh, small production uh, scenario is very cool. It's got about a three inch blade. It'll have some sweet carbon fiber. And uh, yeah, so there it is. Just wanted to mention that. Right. And what is it about this knife, Bob? And we'll, we'll of course, have links to all these knives we're talking about in the show notes at thenifejunkie.com slash 135, thenifejunkie.com slash 135. What is about this knife that you like? It's just a long slender knife looks like I, to me I, I gotta be honest with you jim there's not much that i do like it's carbon okay. fiber and I, i'm not crazy about the design or the size but i am crazy about the maker michael ziba i mean his mm. his his work is tremendous and uh he's he's someone i think that you know kind of deserves to be seen more and more and and, and this is a it, it's a great little edc blade and and i'll it, it checks a lot of boxes for a lot of people it's not not personal to my taste but other knives of his, uh, other folders and kitchen knives of his really are. So I'm, I'm excited to see his work going a little more, uh, a little more mainstream, but with MKM, you know, these very, very skilled Italian knife makers. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, uh, you had mentioned uh, back when you were talking about the CRKT design, and I didn't get a chance to uh, mention it at that point. Uh, about having a Levon from the Knife Nuts uh, podcast uh, carrying that. And, of course, we interviewed him. If you want to hear that interview uh, that Bob did with Levon, that's at thenifejunkie.com slash 128, thenifejunkie.com slash 128. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. All right, back on the Knife Junkie podcast, dare I say, Bob's favorite time because... uh, (laughs) He gets to talk about his knives, man. And uh, first up, uh, interview with uh, Jimmy Slash. And uh, when you did that, you guys were talking about the the new Formax or the Formax Scout. And uh, Jimmy Slash said, "You don't have one. Let me let me get you one to take a look at." And and you've got it now. It's an well great guy and unbelievable gesture. This Formax Scout is amazing. Okay, so I've never had a Formax. If you're if you've been living in a cold and dark place, the Formax is a uh, four-inch version of the AD10, or at least uh, when Andrew Demko designed it, that's what he was looking to do. Uh, the AD10 is a 3.6-inch blade, I believe, uh, drop point, uh, very, very beefy. He wanted to up that to, this is all in his personal shop uh, a, a while back, his uh, custom shop. He wanted to up that to a four inch blade. And to do that, he had to curve the handle and make some changes. And so the Formax was born. And then uh, Cold Steel took it on, uh, I don't know, five years back. They made some in Italy, they made some in America, and then they came out with the Scout. And the reason they came out with the Scout is those Italian and American made Formaxes are three and four hundred bucks. But, you know, uh, uh, Cold Steel earned their bones with guys like me who don't necessarily buy every knife at 400 bucks. So they decided, uh, why not make the Formax Scout in a uh, scaled down version, not in size, but in materials like they did with Mm -hmm. the SR1. Hence the scaled down price, too. Exactly. Exactly. So it's got a uh, So it's the Formax in in every way, except the handles instead of G10 are FRN. Same with the backspacer. Uh, a nicely stippled uh, FRN, by the, the way. RN, by the way, I think I remember. Fiberglass reinforced nylon. Right, exactly. Nylon. And, and <laughs> very, very well. And Cold Steel uses grivery. I'm not sure if that's if that's their version of it, uh, but their version goes by they call it grivery. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the blade, this giant, beautiful, very broad, 
uh, drop point blade, which is mostly flat ground, not not fully flat ground, uh, is in Aus 10 steel, cold steel. Even when they use the cheesiest, uh, lowest grade steel, really, really knows how to heat treat their their blades. They were using Aus 8 for a long time. Aus 8A is a Japanese uh, ingot steel. It's uh, stainless, very nicely stainless, gets very, very sharp, but doesn't hold the edge for very long. And, uh, you know, Cold Steel about four years back started uh, changing all their steels out, getting rid of the OS 8 and replacing it with S35EN and, and C, uh, XHP steel. And just recently, they started using OS 10 in their budget blades. Now, OS 10, it sounds like OS 8, but apparently, from a lot of the testers you can find right. online because I haven't done any, any of this testing. OS 10 is a considerable step up from uh, AUS 8A. A stands for annealed. Uh, so they do the uh, they do the same thing with this uh, OS 10, but it is way more robust. And when I say the same thing, I mean they heat treat it mm -hmm. uh, you know, in such a way that gotcha. they get the absolute m uh, most out of this. Gotcha. Well, uh, maybe we can... Uh you can write a note on your hand like you do to remind <laughs> yourself to uh, get me a picture of that knife as well as the next one we'll talk about that uh, we can put in the show notes uh, that uh, as you're listening to this podcast, uh, you can find at thenifejunkie.com slash 135, thenifejunkie.com slash 135. We'll try to get a, a picture of the 4Max Scout to add to the show notes. As well as, well, before I do that, let me just re remind folks, uh, uh, the Jimmy Slash interview was the most recent podcast, episode mm -hmm. number 134, which uh, came out this past Sunday. So it's still the latest one on the Knife Chunkies homepage, as well as in the uh, the playlist and all that kind of good stuff. YouTube channel, where again, uh, it's the I think the first uh, of the new video uh, podcast we went with that you'll find at, uh, at uh, YouTube. So again, uh, that's the current episode 134. Featuring YouTube's Jimmy Slash. All right. The next knife we'll uh, try to get a picture from Bob to put in the show notes as well. The Again, I'll try Chebrukov Bear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think it's just like how it looks. Chebrukov. Chebrukov. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm part of the Apex Pass Around group. Thanks to uh, David uh, Blade Banter, who uh, we're going to be talking to him, not for nothing, coming up soon about uh, his whole process coming out with the knife he's he's got on Kickstarter, which is really, really oh, cool. Oh, that would be very interesting, yeah. Yeah. Kind of the, the business side of the knife making. Yeah, I would, kind of. I would like to hear more of, yeah. Yeah, like a soup to nuts kind of thing, you know. Yeah. So uh, um, this Chebrikov bear came to me through the uh, through the Pass Around group, and as I've mentioned on this show many times, uh, I think Russian knives have a very distinct look, and uh, this, this knife is no different. It just looks like a Russian knife. There's something brutal and very graceful about their designs and um it's kind of the same when you hear a russian woman speak it's like that beautiful sound of uh, i love the way russian and eastern european women sound when they speak okay so that's what this looks like in person <laughs> okay that was maybe, easy for you to say <laughs> maybe you can cut that but i'm sure you won't <laughs> I'm sure I won't. So the chebrikov bear is a big beautiful clip point blade with a fuller down the middle it is a Bowie as uh, interpreted through the Russian folder designers, if you will. It's got a uh, very thin and slender, but sturdy as hell, titanium handle with, with all this fluting. And it, this thing is just a beast. All right. It's, it's a four and a half inch blade. And when it flies open, uh, because of all that size in the blade, it, it really, it really flies open fast. Now, I've not taken this apart, and I won't. Uh, I see I could, uh, but since it's not mine, I'm not going to. But I think it's on uh, I think it's on thrust bearings, but uh, the card that came with it, the information card, it came in a beautiful leather pouch also, Jim. But look at this information card. Do you recognize any of those letters? Didn't think so. It's all in Cyrillic. It's, it's uh, what, Russian, I guess. It's all in Russian language, uh, so I can't read any of the specs. So I'm just speculating, but I don't know. It's, it's all, it's all a heart thing for me, Jim. This, this just, I opened it up and it, it just sang to my heart and I just wanted to mention it because it's, this is how everyone should be making knives. 4.1 and a half, you know, four and a half inches, big Bowie, pocketable. The one problem I have, you look at that uh, clip and it is a work 
of modern sculpture. It is beautiful. Look at that on the side, on the front. It is gorgeous and definitely looks like a Russian clip to me, but it does not go in and out of the pocket with any ease at all. Going in, you you need to lift it up, but it's like, you know, it's like trying to lift a Mack truck with your with your thumbnail or with your fingernail. And then once it's already in and you try and pull it out, it's going it, to, I mean, it, it, there must be a little blade there. It will shred right. your pocket immediately. Mm. <laughs> well, maybe uh, when you're taking the picture of it, then you can also take a, a close up of the clip so we yeah. can uh, get a picture of that because as folks are listening right now, they're going, what, what are you talking about? What does it look like? What does it look like? So yeah, be sure to go to the knifejunkie.com for all the show notes for our podcast where we try to put visuals. This one will be at the knifejunkie.com slash 135. Uh, Jim, before I stop bloviating poetic <laughs> about this knife, uh, it is in CPM S60V, which is twice S30V. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I've I, I've never experienced S60V, and and you know, obviously, I'm not going to put this anywhere near its limits. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you, this thing breezes through paper like it's not even there. Mm. It falls away, terrified of this mm. Russian bear. Well, there you have it. If you have. Uh... Any experience with what was the the steel there? Blah 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 something sixty <laughs> CPM. So it's an American steel, but uh, CPM S sixty V. All right. Well, if you have any experience with that, uh, give us a call on the listener line and let us know what you like about that seal steel versus the thirty seven two four four six six four four eight seven. 724-466-4487. Visit the Knife Junkie at thenifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. All right, back on the Knife Junkie podcast, uh, as I kind of teased a little bit and Bob mentioned, uh, uh, doing some uh, knife uh, making, knife working, I think, this past weekend and uh, got into uh, making some call style knives. So this segment of the show, you're going to talk about call style knives as well as uh, self-defense usage. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it's been a while that uh, the Pakal style knife, that is a knife that you're intended to carry in an ice pick grip with the blade protruding from the bottom of your fist, but also, you know, so the point down, but the edge in towards you. Hmm. And, uh, you know, Spyderco has a folding Pakal. A, a number of knife companies have, have started making uh, the Pakal style knives. Uh, let's see. Emerson has their, um, their Elvia that they made recently uh, with Ed Calderon. And uh, I've kind of been, I don't know, uh, what's the word? Lusting? Envious? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Doubtful of, of its oh. efficacy without years of training with uh, gotcha. point down, edge in kind of stuff. But after a recent conversation, which will be on the Knife Junkie podcast coming up soon. Hint, hint, tease, tease. Hint, hint, tease, tease. It totally dawned on me the use of this. And um, it was described to us like this, and you'll hear this on that podcast. I, I asked... Why Why would you go for a Pakal style knife with the tip down and the edge in when you could have a um, karambit with a ring around your finger and the edge forward uh, with that curve and the point down? And um, and the guest said, well, people people give a lot of lip service to the karambit exists everywhere in nature. It's a claw. It's like a tiger's claw. And then he but then with the claw up, he said, but but tigers don't don't grab up and mm -hmm. pull up and slash out. They do the opposite. They, their claws retract. Are curved downward. Are, are curved downward, sink into whatever it is and mm -hmm. pull towards them. It's a ripping kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's a gripping and ripping kind of thing. And suddenly it made sense to me. The whole point of the Pical uh, style knife with the edge in, it, it's not for doing nuanced dueling style knife fighting techniques. A lot of um, what I've been taught and a lot of uh, traditional knife techniques are kind of come out of that dueling context. Two people of you know equal intent with knives in their hands, squaring off and going at it. Well, the whole Pakal style of self-defense using the edge in, tip down, is you're way closer. Someone has just jumped you. It, mm -hmm. It's not a dual scenario. It's a, it's a quick fight for your life nightmarish brutal situation yeah exactly and you're and you're instead of um instead of practicing your attributes and doing uh you know beautiful florettis and and dancing around and yeah, moving gracefully right and 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 executing complex techniques against a, a knife wielder you're 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 pulling out your knife 
and you're doing a sewing machine on them, you know, mm-hmm. like you see in prison movies uh, mm-hmm. or, or whatever. And, and, and so this guest, uh, I can't wait till he comes on, you know, till we, but he was talking about the actual nature of modern day knife encounters. That's not to say that these duels haven't happened throughout history and throughout most of history, but we live in a different time right now. We live in an age of a, of the gun and anything where you're sort of uh, using your knife, it's most likely uh, a surprise incident. Mm-hmm. So, so the, the stress is on easy uh, access and, um, and your most strong, uh, cr- uh, your, your most strong strike, which is that sort of hammer fist strike. Mm-hmm. So this weekend I, I took a knife design that I've been working on that just kind of stalled out. And you know me, I'm not, I, I don't work every weekend on the, it's, it's like a hobby catches catch can. And, uh, I decided to change a knife that I was working on. That was a, it was like a sort of worn cliff and turned it into, uh, a, my own Pical style, uh, you know, tiger claw knife. And I'm going to, you know, have it heat treated professionally and, and make it and, and just, I don't know. I'm very excited about this sort of revelation. Uh, just a couple of quick notes. Pikal means to rip in Visayan, which is, uh, you know, uh, Filipino. Hmm. And it's not as specialized as you think, uh, you know, or as I was thinking, like, how the hell do you fight edge? I mean, I know from Pekiti Tertia and some things I've learned how to fight edge in tip down, but it's not, it's not intuitive and it's not, or, or at least that's what I thought. But because it's unlike dueling and because it's unlike knife on knife contact that you might learn in martial arts class right right uh it, it really makes sense so close close combat gross kind of, motor skill right adrenaline dump technique right right you know stabbing 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 you know kind, kind yeah. of thing sewing yeah. machine so anyway uh, you know i don't I, I am not a violent individual and i don't get into knife fights but but it, it has always always captured my imagination and in doing so it feels like a useful interest in case God forbid that ever happens. It's interesting and good that I have that interest. So um, this is a sort of a little evolution of that interest and a, a widening of my perspective. And I, I always like it when I'm myth busted a little bit. Yeah, uh, you know, interesting. All right. Well, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to uh, hear from uh, folks out there, listeners. Uh, do you have any uh, experience with uh, you know Pakal style knives or uh, you know knife fighting or self defense training and that kind of thing? And you know, have you used them? What's your thoughts? Did Bob uh, you know turn your thinking around a little bit and uh, kind of give you a little bit of education too? As he had his aha moment, uh, give us a call at uh, the listener line seven two four four six six four four eight seven, or you can shoot Bob an email at bob at the knife dot com. But as we say all the time. It's much better if you would uh, leave us a call on the listener line, leave us a message. That way uh, we can actually hear your voice and we can share your voice on the podcast. 724-466-4487. All right, Bob, buddy, about running out of time here on this podcast. Any uh, final thoughts about the knives in your collection or the the Pakal style knives you're working on or or anything else we've talked about or not talked about? No, uh, the the only... uh... Incoming excitement is uh, is my uh, altered and modified Spidey Chef that mm-hmm. is coming. Uh, I should probably have it. Uh, well, I, I will now. have it by the time you're listening to this. I should have it in hand. Mike Emler took it and uh, did some things to it, and I can't <laughs> wait to see it. Well, of course, uh, if you're listening as the uh, podcast is coming out on Wednesday night, don't forget to join us on uh, Thursday Night Knives tomorrow night. If you're a member of the uh, Knife Junkie Patreon group at thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon, you'll, of course, have early access to this podcast on Tuesday. So uh, Thursday is two days away from you, Patreon members. So thanks for being a member and thanks for your support. And uh, next Sunday on uh, this interview episode of the podcast, we're going to talk to or Bob's going to talk to uh, Sanford Owen from Monterey Bay Knives. Sanford Owen, Monterey Bay Knives. That'll be coming up this coming Sunday. Uh, on the interview show on thenifejunkie.com. All right. So for the Knife Junkie himself, Mr. Bob DeMarco, I'm Jim the Knife Newbie over here saying thanks for joining us on episode number 135 of the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Point, point.